studying early modern Mediterranean. So it's roughly, roughly is about uh, 16th to 18th century. And I'm studying precisely the end of the 17th and the beginning of 18th century. I'm trying to understand how people were thinking about themselves, how they were rep representing their own identities, uh, their own lives, uh, the meaning that they, they were giving to the world or to ethical or religious values and so on. The way I'm trying to do this is through documents in which is recorded the way people were acting or were doing things in their in everyday life. Early modern historians are using this word cultural pluralism, which means different groups in the same space. Medrut is trying to compare how different groups were allowed to live in four port cities, which are Esmer, Valletta, Livorno and Marseille. Izmir, or Smyrna, was a thriving port in the Ottoman Empire. Non-Muslim Ottoman subjects, like Greeks, Jews and Armenians, lived there, and Europeans mingled with them. The Christian foreigners lived in the part of the city called Frank Street. When we are in this street, we seem to be in Christendom. They speak nothing but Italian, French, English or Dutch there. The botanist, Joseph Piton de Tournefort, described life in the port city. They sing publicly in the churches. They chant, they preach and perform divine service there without any trouble. Esmer is a place in which European could live as Europeans. So um, I think that what is interesting here is that this city was uh, really allowing people of expressing their own identity or original identity or perceived identity. It was a city that was uh, not forcing people to adjust to a way of living of the cultural group that was owning the political authority. It's interesting to see that these people could go openly go to the church, while in the European countries there was a big struggle for cultural groups, uh, religious groups that were different, to obtain also the opportunity to profess their religion freely and openly. They were doing it publicly, which is very important to my uh, research, to, as the, the fact that you are visible in the public space. So Antonio de Valdisore arrived in Esmer in 1721 as a visitor and he was saying that the parishioner of the, of the two Catholic uh, parish churches were mixing with uh, Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. Uh, and this is a problem that it points out through the case of Anna Boget. Anna Boget was a Catholic French woman and she might have looked like this. She was married to a wealthy French merchant. When Anna Bouget's only child fell ill, she did what many European women in Izmir did. She sent for priests. But the priests she turned to to bless her sick daughter weren't Catholic. The visiting Catholic vicar from Rome, Antonio Valdisole, was fuming. Against my admonitions, she called a group of Greek fathers every night to bless the girl, to ward off what they call air spirits, as well as other fire superstitions. And she also took communion according to the Greek rite. Everyone was talking about it. And he's complaining that since she's so prominent, she's a very public figure, uh, other girls are following her example and are getting married with uh, Greek Orthodox men. So uh, for Antonio was, uh, a scandal, <laughs> because they are using a lot of this word, there was a scandal, which is uh, something that is uh, going against uh, is, uh, the, the perception of what is wrong and what is right, and this scandal, this, this thing is happening in a public way. So, uh, as an historian, I found Vanna Boget's situation as very interesting, because uh, first of all, it's a matter of uh, uh, syncretism. So, she believes that both, both approaches, both the Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox approach and the Roman life and Catholic approach are the same or are basically the same thing. 
And second is because she really d doesn't uh, give importance to what authorities of a re cultural and religious group are telling her, her that is right. She decided something and she did it. So um, uh, she, she has the space of really changing uh, the way in which uh, people are acting because she's considered to be one of the, one of the examples that other European wom women are following. In Izmir, Europeans could mix with other religious groups in ways that would have been forbidden at home. But in another port, foreigners had to follow the local religious practices. On the other side, we have Valletta, which was the bulwark of Christianity, which means that it was the embodiment of a frontier. Valletta is defined by being the shield of the Christianity. And it was strongly marked out as a Catholic environment, protected by the Knights of the Order of St. John and the Inquisitor of Malta. The most significant free foreign group were English Protestants. Many Englishmen converted to Catholicism and found Maltese women to marry to settle there. But Protestants didn't have to convert. Malta's secular powers wanted to attract the Englishmen, who were allowed to move and act as they pleased on the island. That is, unless they publicly displayed their Protestant religious behaviour and created a scandal. was watching out for scandals and the ingredients of a scandal could be found right here on a plata. Fasting was very important in Malta because Malta, Malta was a Catholic country. Uh, not only Catholic were fasting actually, but in, uh, after the Council of Trent, fasting became a very important sign of belonging. Well, on a fasting day uh, you should not eat a lot of things, <laughs> meat, uh, eggs and cheese, and dairy products, not only cheese, so everything that was made of uh, milk was forbidden, everything that was made with eggs was forbidden, and everything, of course, that was involved, involving meat. So, you know, poultry, uh, chicken, beef, everything. There was a case of two Protestant English merchants. They arrived in Malta during the fasting period, Lent. They went into a tavern, and told the landlord that they were not Catholic and wanted to eat meat. The landlord refused. And the newcomers kept asking. Until the door opened and in came six Catholic knights of the Order of St. John. The knights demanded meat too. Then the landlord served it. So as a historian, I'm looking at the way in which people are like declaring their own identity through daily life and through what we are doing in daily life. So to follow a prescription in eating, uh, it means that I am changing my either identity. So it's a matter of identity. I'm deciding to keep my identity if I'm not fasting or to uh, be absorbed in the either identity of the island of Malta. The other thing that for me is very interesting is the way in which these people, these this, uh, English merchants, were stressing their identity through their eating choices. They are saying, I mean, uh, directly, I mean, precisely, uh, they are using this, uh, these words with the owner of the tavern, that we don't want to fast because we are not Catholic. How the Protestant English merchants behaved was described in the handwritten record of the trial held in front of the Inquisitor. Malta was very strict because they have the Inquisition and what was really crucial to the Maltese Inquisition was that people should be at least formally following what was prescribed. The two English merchants were denounced uh, to the Inquisition by their servants. The witness is saying that they are still inviting fellow countrymen that are arriving in Malta to their home and they are still 
continuing eating meat in their private home. Since there is no one that is witnessing what, they, what is happening inside this private home, it's quite difficult to understand what is going on. So probably nothing happened to them. If there was no a public disclosure of a different way of eating, probably they will remain untouched. The Inquisitor of Malta wanted people living following the rules and the prescription of the Catholic Church. On the other side, the, the, the local authorities in Malta were not interested in this. They wanted to attract English merchants, they wanted to attract non-Catholic merchants, because Malta was okay, it was the bulwark of Christianity from one side, but from the other side, it was a place in the center of the Mediterranean that was living from this uh, exchange of different people coming. In Valletta, foreigners were caught between the secular and the religious authorities. But far from the frontier of Christianity, a new port city promised foreigners freedom, protection and respect. So Livorno was probably the only city, I think, that has been built with this idea of attracting diversity in order to make something different, also in economic terms, of course, because this was the idea of the Grand Duke in the beginning. The Grand Duke of Tuscany, Ferdinando I, made Livorno a free port. And the Livornine laws allowed merchants of the world to live in the city and practice their own religion. So the Livornine laws were very special because uh, it was the first time that someone was uh, granting uh, religious rights in such a direct way to non-Catholic groups in Italy. Uh, and they are considered to be very important uh, pieces of laws uh, for, that, for that period and also for the history of tolerance and rights. Tolerance in, in, in the early modern period is not to be understood as tolerance in the way we are seeing uh, today. Uh, of course, Livorno was much more tolerant compared to other spaces, but people were still living apart, like in Izmir. I mean, groups are, were very defined, at least there was an attempt to keep them separated uh, by the central authorities. The central secular authorities wanted to avoid conflicts between the different local and foreign religious groups. So they made other laws to stop people mixing too much. A tragic death shows the contradiction of these policies. A Jewish merchant's wife died in childbirth. Cohen Satoni was left with his newborn girl and no way to care for her. He hired a wet nurse to feed the baby, but that decision cost him his tiny daughter because the nurse was a Christian, and laws in Livorno prohibited Christian nurses from looking after non-Christian babies. Some prohibitions uh, in Livorno uh, were mainly directed to daily life. Christian wet nurses could not feed uh, non-Christian babies, newly born. The Jewish merchants could not have a Christian shop boy. There were also uh, several Jewish um, uh, medical doctors. They, were, they could not go and heal uh, Christian, uh, Christian patients. But these prohibitions were not followed because uh, we can see in the documents that there were, there were always problems about this. So that means that people were really mixing. The authorities offered exemptions to their own rules. Cohen Satoni promised he would get an official permission to allow the Christian wet nurse to care for his Jewish daughter. The wet nurse waited and waited, but the paper did not arrive. So the wet nurse had the baby baptised as a Christian. She decided to baptise the child which was a way for her to feel not only good towards the law, but also to feel, I think, uh, comfortab comfortably towards her own belief, because uh, to baptize a child is to um, save the soul of, uh, of a creature. And for this reason, there was this prohibition to, uh, to give uh, non-Christian babies to Christian wet nurses, because this was one of the most common uh, reasons we can find in documents regarding uh, forced baptisms. The result of the forced baptism is described in this letter. 
So the letter was written by the governor of Livorno talking about this petition done by the Jewish community of Livorno. Uh, the Jewish uh, community asked the governor of Livorno to have this baby back because of course with baptism the baby entered the Catholic community so she was lost to her father. The Jewish father lost his baby girl because not even Livorno's secular governor could reverse a religious baptism. The way the local political authorities acted influenced how foreigners were allowed to live in many port cities surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. Further west, France tried to open Marseille to foreign merchants too, but the local authorities had other plans. And that is a tale for another time. Until then, Medroot goes on. What I was thinking when the plan after this project, after Medroot, is to continue this travel and trying to extend it to other parts of the Mediterranean that I have not um, covered. Trying to deepen some aspects that are related to the idea of um, Identity as a, per as a performance. This is a project that cannot be done by one person. Uh, so uh, what I'm planning is to uh, build a research group that will use this base, the metro base, uh, as a starting point for going further on. Especially the inquiry on the Mediterranean is something that must be done by a group of people that are sharing methodology, that are sharing their uh, findings that are sharing, I think, a common vision. <laughs>